So I've been asked to give a talk um, on the state of the world, uh, how we got here, and what do we do now? So um, at the outset, I just wanted to um, uh, say what I'm hoping to achieve in this talk, because it's very broad ranging. Um, and um, what I want to do is to try and uh, paint a picture of the impact that humanity is having on the planet. Now, in Arosha, we are, um, most of us, working in particular places and trying to address the problems that we humans have caused in particular places. But what I think is important for us all to understand is that everything is interconnected and that we, um, uh, the problems that we experience at the local level are actually driven mainly by global phenomena. So in this rather fuzzy graph here, I just want to point out, don't worry about all the lines. I want you to look at the purple line that is a dashed line that's going up, this line here, okay? And this is global population and how it has been rising. Um, and it um, over a 50 year period or so, global population has doubled. But what I also want you to notice is this black line, which is basically the global economy. And over the same time period, the global economy has grown massively faster, probably three times faster than the um, uh, global population. Now, obviously the rising population is one of the drivers of the rising economy, but the economy is growing three times faster than the population. It's very common in the developed world to blame all the problems of the world on overpopulation in those countries in the south with faster growing populations. But actually our growing economy is having a bigger impact and much of the global growth in the economy that's taken place in the last 50 years is among countries that were already rich. So that is where a lot of the impact that we're having in the world is coming from. Now, obviously, there's been huge economic growth also in Asia, but still, we none of us can look at the problems of the world being created by somebody else. But we've all done it ourselves because we're all part of the global economy. And so various maps have been produced like this. Um, so um, th this one shows um, countries in red that are taking more out of the world than they're giving back and countries in green uh, the other way around that are net suppliers. Um, so the whole idea of ecological deficit, you get these ecological clocks that the Global Footprinters uh, Network has, um, has produced. And, and um, th this um, shows the time in the year when each country has used up used up its total year's allowance. So here I am in the UK, and under this measurement, which is a few years old now, we had overspent by May the 8th. Today, on June the 7th, uh, is Fiji, for instance. And, um, and you see that the enormous numbers of countries are living beyond their ecological means. And then these are another ways people do it of, of distorting the geographies to show show you how particular countries are having, especially in um, uh, uh, North America, Europe, and parts of Asia, are having a disproportionate impact um, on the world. But um, so 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 because of the growing economy and the growing uh, population, we are placing unsustainable demands on the world, and um, we tend to think of the um, problems of the world around climate change, poverty, inequality, and biodiversity loss. But actually, we're not intentionally, for the most part, bringing around those pro problems. What we are actually doing is we're demanding food, water, en and energy, um, and we're creating an enormous amount of built infrastructure and a huge amount of waste. And these five things are what drives the world's problems. And so I'm going to quickly look at all of those. And those things all drive climate change, poverty, inequality, and biodiversity loss. Now, if that was our only problem, if we could get these things in balance, 
then all these things in the middle would recover. But unfortunately, as we all know, those pressures driving climate change, poverty, inequality, and biodiversity loss, these unfortunately make each other worse. So um, increased uh, climate change drives poverty and drives both biodiversity loss. Biodiversity loss drives climate change and poverty. Um, poverty causes uh, uh, lifestyles that, that in turn drive biodiversity loss. And so this is where we are at in the world today, that we have five major pressures caused by humans that cause three major crises that themselves make each other worse and we end up in a downward spiral. And that, in a nutshell, is my take on the current global situation. And I just want to look, um, and, I, and I wanted to frame it that way because we are um, the way we need to look at how we're living is, is much bigger than some, some, some of these debates that we sometimes get into in conservation organizations. Like, are we about biodiversity? Are we about climate change? What are our priorities? But actually, um, we're in a much bigger interconnected system and we need to look at those questions with an understanding of those interconnected systems. Um, so food security, probably the biggest single driver of um, uns unsustainability in the world is agriculture. And if you look at this map, it shows you that the, some countries in the bright green have basically have way too much food, um, massive waste, and other countries don't know where their next meal's coming from in the dark colors and that had this huge inequity. And of course, some of these countries in the, dark, uh, in, in the dark colors or the red colors are actually providing food for the people in the green countries. And if we look at the 2010 global population of 7 billion over here, and the uh, anticipated 2050 population of 9 to 10 billion, you can see what needs to be done if we're to feed a world of 9 to 10 um, billion will need more sugar, more meat, more cereals, more vegetables, more oil, seed crops. So 60% more food, but we'll probably have 40% less water and we're wasting 30% of food products, etc. And so this we cannot carry on as we are. We cannot make these demands on the planet much longer. We have to find new and innovative ways to feed ourselves globally. Um, and agriculture is um, um, responsible for a large percentage of greenhouse gases, 26%. Um, uh, um, agriculture is using about 50% of the habitable land in the world. Um, it's responsible for 70% of the global use of fresh water and carry on with the um, huge proportion of the global pollution is caused by agriculture. 94% um, of mammal biomass, excluding humans, is actually domestic livestock. So the way in which we're feeding ourselves is completely unsustainable. Jump to water security, because perhaps we focus on this one less in conservation. Um, a different set of countries, the countries that are really struggling um, uh, with water are very often the richer countries, plus India and China, um, South Africa too. Um, and um, but other places as well. Look at northern Nigeria. Um, so so again, we're making enormous and unsustainable demands on water, and you can see the same sort of idea here of how the disproportionate use of water um, in 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 this distortion of country boundaries. When we think of um, human livelihoods and biodiversity loss, one of the biggest impacts of water use is the fragmentation of rivers by dams and barrages for irrigation. And the red rivers are the, are the rivers that are already fragmented. And the blue rivers are the rivers that are much less or not fragmented at all. And you'll just see how in basically in the last hundred years, we have done that to the world's rivers. Let's say uh, jumping to energy demand, um, and you can see that the demands for the uh, global energy have been growing massively since 1965, and uh, uh, that's projected to continue. And you'll see how we provide, our, uh, get our energy, and a huge proportion 
um, maybe look at the graph on the right here, is from hydrocarbons, from um, uh, greenhouse gas producing sources, um, and from hydro. And you can see this, um, this uh, graph here suggesting rather, um, this, I uh, can't remember who did this, this was the 2017 energy outlook, and rather small drops or drop offs in the use of uh, fossil fuels and um, uh, steady use of hydro. If we want a sustainable future, both the use of fossil fuels and hydro have to fall away almost completely. Um, and, um, and the renewals in particular um, have, to, have to, to, to rise. I put this one in, oops, went too far, because um, you'll see here another projected use of, of, of where we're going to get our energy from, still a massive amount from hydrocarbons, um, but um, I want to point out a very sinister thing that tends to go in, on is that hydropower gets put in within renewables and therefore somehow the belief that hydropower is green, something that we should never accept as conservationists. So this sort of thing um, in China caused the extinction of uh, one of the most, the Chinese paddlefish, uh, one of the most remarkable uh, freshwater fish in the world, one of the longest. Jumping on to the uh, next of our five pressures, uh, we've we've done um, uh, food, water, and energy, urbanization, and infrastructure. Just look at this famous map of the night and just see where humans are and how much light we produce across so much of the planet. Hang on a second, I'm just getting my coffee. Thank you. Um, and um, and this map here in some senses is, is even more remarkable uh, because this shows um, how much we have fragmented um, uh, the world with infrastructure, with roads, with railways, with cities, settlements. And, um, and the density of roads across the world is truly phenomenal. So it's either in, um, in un un hard to inhabit places like the Sahara or the far north or Greenland um, or the Amazon basin or Australia, uh, parts of Australia. And you just see how we are fragmenting global habitats. The last thing I wanted to say was waste. A huge discussion on marine plastic. I won't go into it now, except it's something that our marine program does a lot of work on. Let's look at the sources of plastic. Um, and uh, this is um, some measure of some of the particulate aerial pollution, sorry. Um, uh, going on um, around the world. And this, this is another major factor. So we got these five major pressures, uh, but I want to draw your attention to a date. The date is 1950, because around 1950, everything started to change. Look at what happened to global population, look what happened to economic growth, um, look at what happened to energy use, water use, large dams, um, etc. Enormous changes started to take place from 1950, and most of us, including myself, were born after that date. Um, and look what happened to CO2, uh, nitrous oxide, um, uh, ozone, um, marine fish capture. Huge changes then took place as a result of that. So um, increasing number of um, global studies suggest that 1950 was an inflection point. And so we moved from a small world living on a large planet where our changes were sort of incremental and as our impact on the planet was slow. And then suddenly in around 1950, we moved away from linear change to um, as it were exponential change. And this yellow line is a, some sort of vague measure of our impact. And we, in a few decades, we've moved from being a small world on a large planet to being a big world on a small planet. We moved from Earth resilience being high to Earth resilience being low. And a second date, around 1990, um, uh, we basically reached saturation point. And each year we started using more from the planet than the planet could provide. So we now need um, more than a single planet to support our current level of activity. And we've moved from the Holocene, the geological period, the Holocene, 
uh, which probably ended around about 1950, 1955, to now the Anthropocene, where humans are the major impact on the planet. Another way of looking at this is planetary boundaries and looking about how we have exceeded our limits on various measures. I'm going to jump over that now for interest of time, but that's been a very um, important policy relevant um, tool that's been used. Um, and, and as I just said, we tipped in 50 years, we tipped from the 10,000 years of the Holocene into the Anthropocene in which we now live. Um, so to give an idea of what this means, on this um, line here, you'll see global average mean or global mean temperature over the last 20,000 years. And you'll see slow rise um, at the end of the ice ages and very stable temperatures until look at this, it goes vertically up. And uh, there was a groundbreaking agreement with the Framework Convention on Climate Change in Paris. And this is the range, this blue band across here is what uh, Paris is, the Paris Agreement uh, hopes to stabilize temperature increases at. But that band is already probably too high for coral reefs. It will probably lose many alpine glaciers, will probably lose much, if not all, um, summer sea ice. We may jeopardize um, uh, the future of ice on Greenland and possibly even the West um, Antarctic ice sheet. So already with our ambitious plans that we're not meeting, we're already uh, uh, look like we're going to tip some, um, some major um, uh, um, ecological thresholds that would then have consequences that will be hard for us to predict. For instance, if we lose coral reefs, we bring about some permanent change in ocean chemistry, quite apart from the tragedy of losing coral reefs. So in the Holocene, we were in this circle. Oops, sorry, I keep on clicking it wrong. A, a glaciation circle, ice age circle. Um, and so um, and that's been going on for 100,000 years or so. And now with the sorts of agreements like Paris and under the Convention on um, Biodiversity, we're trying to limit um, this to what we call a governed earth, trying to stop it. But there's a huge danger that in fact, we go to an ice sea earth with much higher temperatures and much higher sea le uh, level uh, rise. And, um, and in a sense, tipping to a different kind of world than we have ever known. And this um, picture here is to give us an idea of tipping points. So, so we, um, the earth could have been in this sort of cycle here, but it, we tip over a threshold, but the problem is can't get back or it's extremely high. And so tipping point scientists worry about a great deal. Um, I said a bit about coral reefs and I know we've got some uh, friends from Australia here. Um, this is out of date slides, but terrible bleaching that took place on the goal on the Great Barrier Reef in 2016 and in 2017, um, with the possibilities that some of this can't now recover. Um, and uh, this was just one of the better documented bleaching events that took place across the world. Coral bleaching is driven by warmer um, ocean surface temperatures, which of course is driven by uh, climate change, which is driven by all those factors I mentioned earlier on at the beginning of this talk. Now, um, to address this, um, in uh, 2015, the um, United Nations agreed the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and these are them. Um, now, the Sustainable Development Goals, actually, there are four to do with the biosphere. Uh, the, the life on land, life and water, clean water and sanitation and climate action. And the idea is if you don't deal, if we don't deal as society with the biosphere goals, then we'll never deal with these other, um, other um, societal and economic goals. We'll never get there because the underlying ecosystem will make it impossible. So um, the goals to do with health, poverty, etc will not be achievable if we don't deal with the biosphere goals. So the sustainable development goals are supposed to be um, attained um, in um, 2030. We're not on track to do that. But the idea that's being negotiated is that through sustainable development um, 
um, goals, we might potentially increase the, the sustainability of our development so that by 2050, we end up with a world that's living within planetary boundaries, which I should point out is not a world back in the Holocene, it's a world where we have sort of started to recover. Um, so, and the general idea is through a load of money, through uh, people action and through nature itself, um, operating through the sustainable development goals, we um, end up with world development in a stable um, uh, and resilient earth system. Now, of course, that's not Christian thinking in the sense this is science. Um, and um, human nature and selfishness and short termism is not factored into that. But um, uh, but that uh, is to give you an idea of where global discussions are at when all these big negotiations take place. Um, uh, um, that um, uh, that's the framework of thinking. Now, uh, uh, some of you will have seen this slide that's been doing the rounds for quite a while. Um, uh, we've been living through the most dreadful pandemic. It's hit a number of Russia organizations really badly. Um, uh, we need to remember, especially Russia, India, and Russia, Peru at the moment, but I'm sure others as well really struggling with it. Um, uh, and it's been a terrible tragedy. But the idea, of, obviously, of this cartoon is the recession that's going to follow the COVID is going to be even bigger. But but the climate change um, behind that's going to be even bigger, but you wait for the biodiversity collapse. Now, um, what worries me slightly about that sort of thinking is that um, these things tend to set um, climate change and biodiversity as alternative um, uh, uh, choices that we have to make. And actually, as I hope, to, hope I showed earlier on, actually climate change and biodiversity loss are integrally tied up with each other. And we have no choice but to deal with both. We can't save biodiversity without dealing with climate change and vice versa. Um, now, because Russia has traditionally been a biodiversity conservation organization, I want, and because it's a thing I know a little bit about, I wanted to say something um, about the major threats to biodiversity loss. And I wanted to point out that they are a bit different uh, between ecosystems. So on terrestrial ecosystems, habitat loss, which is driven especially by agriculture and urbanization, is overwhelmingly the driving cause of biodiversity loss. But then for some species groups, um, we have these other threats such as novel diseases, invasive species, um, uh, wildlife use and change, um, um, trade, etc. In freshwater ecosystems, habitat alteration, but especially dis the disruption of water flow is the driving cause of species loss, but also um, pollution. But then for some species groups, some other factors as well. But in marine, overwhelmingly it's overfishing and non-selective bottom trawling. Um, and increasingly being caught up by ocean warming and acidification. And then we've got new threats such as deep sea mining, plastics, etc. So it's quite different between them. And um, uh, the threats to biodiversity are very multifarious. So for instance, uh, acidification, the impact it's had on forests and look at the impact it's had on various monitored fungi species. Um, uh, we've had, um, amphibians have had their own pandemic going on with very little publicity, a fungal pandemic called Cotridia mycosis since the 1970s. This is a gastric brooding frog, one of the two species from Australia that's now extinct. Um, uh, and novel diseases generally are um, uh, um, a growing threat to biodiversity. Um, fishing pressure, look how it's increased massively um, uh, in, in this 50 year period after that inflection point I mentioned earlier, post-1950. Um, and I mentioned coral reefs again. Um, so a third of coral reef species are now believed to be at risk of extinction. Um, and uh, they were already well above the um, maximum CO2 level in the atmosphere that coral reefs require. And, um, and uh, so that is a, is, is a major 
perhaps the biggest um, uh, biodiversity um, uh, crisis we're facing. So this diagram shows you that extinction always happened. Um, so it, for roughly every thousand species, one went extinct every millennium in the fossil record. We're now um, uh, three orders of magnitude higher than that. So we've moved from this level of natural extinction to this already, which is going on and the model future extinction rate 10 times higher than now. And this has led to very high levels of threat. So 40% from amphibians, 25% from mammals. This is from the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species, uh, which is the um, official um, listing of threatened species on which I spent much of my life working, as many of you know. The crisis is getting worse. This is the IUCN Red List Index, and you'll see that every line for every group of species measured, every line is going down, even these ones that seem to be going down gently like mammals. Remember, the time scale is very short here. They're actually going down very fast, dramatically fast in the case of corals. Some groups like cycads are already really low down the axis, down to 50% um, on the red list index. So, so we've got um, an accelerating crisis. And basically, we're in a world where the state of biodiversity is getting worse, the, uh, um, the pressure is increasing rapidly. I've got it linear there, but it's probably exponential. But the response that we've been making to that has actually been leveling off. The world has actually not been increasing its response to the crisis. Um, and, and so we're getting a growing disparity between the response and the pressure, and that drives further decline in state. Um, but I also want, um, this picture would be very depressing, and also inaccurate if I left it there because um, there's been a lot of successful conservation, including done by um, Arosha. So in 1990, no, sorry, in 2000 and something, I can't remember, a group of friends and I, we uh, did a study where we looked at what happened with the world's ungulates, with deer and cattle, and these are all the wild species, okay? About two to 300 species. And we looked at what happened on the red list index, and this is what actually happened. The recorded increase in extinction risk of ungulates between 1996 and 2008. And then we did a thought experiment, and we looked at what would have happened if conservation measures hadn't happened. And that is the difference. That's the counterfactual red list index, which is uh, what would have happened if we'd stopped protected areas, we'd stopped um, uh, uh, laws, we stopped captive breeding in zoos, all those things. And the difference over just a 12 year period, the difference between these two lines is um, the effect of conservation, which is remarkable given how little is spent on conservation. That the little bit we did already, although it didn't bring about a recovery of all the world's ang ungulates, it, it massively slowed down their decline. And in some species, there was a recovery. This is an average line. Um, look at this. This is the world's rhinoceros species. We're used to hearing about all the um, poaching of rhinos, but actually this is the population trend of white rhinos. And there's been some significant poaching in recent years, but it hasn't actually been enough to bring the white rhino population down. It's leveled it off a bit. Black rhino increasing more slowly from a lower base. The Indian rhino um, actually increasing increasingly quickly in recent years, especially since this, um, this um, uh, graph was done. And then the Javan and Sumatran rhino in dire trouble. But the, um, uh, you get almost universally a negative press report on rhinos, but actually three species are increasing. Okay, I just want to raise uh, at the end, this is the last slide, a few factors um, that we need to think about um, uh, in terms of what we do. And the first is long-termism. So one of the great features of Arosha is that we commit to places and issues long-term. And that's incredibly important because the way that funding cycles work and the way that donors work, both um, uh, um, public sector and private sector donors is to fund projects and to fund 
two, three, five, if you're lucky, five year projects. But to bring about um, a sustainable planet, we're bringing about societal and um, ecological change, which doesn't happen in three or five years. This is, these are generational changes. And so long-termism is important. One of the reasons why I went to um, work for Synchronicity Earth is because it was a donor which had long-termism in view. So that, um, that's the point I just made. The types of funding and the way that conservation is supported is just wrong. And so we need to be part of a movement that, um, that, um, that uh, uh, promotes long-term approaches. Um, very often uh, you get projects that are over-invested for a few years and then run out of money. What we probably need is less money over more time. Um, when I spoke to every single Russia organization after I just started, um, every single Russia organization in a, developing, in a developing country started off more or less by conservation being in the context of poverty. Um, and earlier on, I explained, or I tried to explain how poverty and biodiversity loss are intricately tied in with each other. Um, almost none, I think none of the arrows in developed countries had this as a focus. But when we look at it globally, um, we cannot talk about dealing with a sustainable future without addressing poverty and inequity. Um, political commitment, countries that have had taken a long-term view on um, conservation. And I, um, so some of the Southern African countries, India, for example, um, uh, some European countries, um, many states in the US, for instance, um, uh, have taken very long-term views that have had disproportionate impact, even in the context of limited money, uh, money and in the context of poverty. So political commitment really, um, really matters. Land tenure is absolutely key. Where people don't have security of land tenure, they are forced into making very short-term decisions about how they use the land to feed themselves, drive shifting agriculture, and many other things. So stabilizing land tenure is incredibly important, and that uh, is in, uh, itself linked to the rule of law, independent judiciaries, and this sort of thing. Uh, um, rule of law and um, independent judiciaries, I would say, are key to achieving conservation. Leadership. Finding leadership is always very um, challenging, but we've had some great examples in Russia. Often leadership is more important than money. Deploying skills correctly, um, conservation and environmental management and sustainable development are inherently multi-disciplinary multi tasks. We can't all be biologists, we can't all be lawyers or communicators or storytellers. We need everyone. And so we need partnerships. We need to work with other organizations. Um, none of us can do it all ourselves. We need a good degree of humility. And then monitoring, the amount spent on monitoring biodiversity. So some of these red list figures you've seen is pitifully small. And so our understanding of our impact and of, of the priorities limit, is limited by the lack of data. And the cost of monitoring, if we were to do it uh, properly, is tiny, it's in the, in the order of a few million a year. And we have some intractable problems for which we lack technical solutions at the moment, such as a pandemics like the amphibians and other species face, the, the coral reef problems, ocean acidification, and we urgently need research uh, to, to find ways to buy time and solutions on those problems. So, so these are just a few of the ideas we have to consider. We, in Russia, will be developing our, um, our um, uh, a strategy um, uh, very, um, very soon. There's a working group being formed, our, our sort of linking strategy across the whole family. And the purpose of this talk was to try and paint the broad picture in, into which that um, strategy is developed. And the extent to which we focus on poverty, climate change, and biodiversity, and how these are in, interlinked will be very important. Um, I'm closing with a picture of a cat bar langer, which is a um, 
uh, a monkey from northern Vietnam uh, that was very close to extinction. It lives on these cast rocks on islands off the shore. Uh, it should have gone extinct, except for a long-term project that was started funding, funded by the Munster Zoo in Germany. It's a little zoo, and they have made a long-term commitment, long-term again, to the people and the place, and the monkey is recovering. There's a lesson. <laughs>